Hebrews 10, 19 through 26, it gives us an outline. I don't know if you're one of those who writes in your Bible or underlines in your Bible, but I, I hope you'll take the opportunity this morning and maybe underline a few of these. It's an upward and an inward and an outward call that is upon every single Christian. You can see that upward call of God in verses 19 through 22 when he says, the author of Hebrews and the Holy Spirit through him says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest of the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We see that first upward call of God on the Christian life, and it is denoted in verse 22 by let us draw near. It's a call from God himself that says, come a little further, come a little closer to me. Draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. That's the upward call of God. It essentially says, because of what Christ has done for us, let us draw near to him. That's the first, the upward. The second is the inward call of God. Verse 23, it is again denoted by let us again. Let us, verse 23, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The inward call of God upon every Christian life is that we would cling to, that we would, with a stone fist, grab onto our confession of hope. And we could say this inward call of God in our life is this. Because of what Christ has done in us, let us hold fast to faith. So the upward is because of what Christ has done for us, let us draw near to him. And because of what Christ has done in us, in us, let us hold fast to our faith. But our third is the outward call of God in our life. And that's seen in verse 24 when the author writes, And let us consider one another in order to stir up or to agitate or to irritate love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We have the upward, we have the inward, and we have the outward. Verse 24 says, let us consider one another. Because of what Christ will do through us, let us consider one another. I mentioned it a little bit in verse 24, whenever he says for us to look at each other and help us to stir up Love and good works. The literal translation of that word in our language would be to irritate. Now, if you are the youngest in your family, as I am, you have been irritated by your older siblings your entire life. It's never the other way around, right? Never the other way around. You have been irritated by, you know, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, and all those different things. What the call of God on the Christian is, as it deals with those outside, is for us to stir up, to irritate, to agitate those other Christians and try to bring them to love and to good work. See, it's a positive thing. And I know all of your flashbacks to long uh, vacation drives across the United States with your sibling, you know, bothering you. That's a negative way. But what he's telling us is, let us be the constant itch in someone's life that we are constantly pushing and, and hoping and presenting that you can do this, you can love, you can have good works, you can follow Christ. And in these few verses, we see the upward, the inward, and the outward call of God. You know, we'll talk a little bit about God's will for your life this morning, those high school, college, and graduate students. I have no idea what God has in store for you specifically, but I can tell each and every one of you that his plan is, is an upward call for you to come closer. It's an inward call for you to hold on to your faith and it's an outward call for you to stir up, to agitate, to, ir to irritate love and good works among the brethren, among other Christians. The local church, I have found, is where those three calls, upward, inward, and outward calls, converge in your life. It is amongst this group of believers or any 
group of believers where the Bible is preached unashamedly. It is among these groups of people that we have that more specific call to a closer relationship with God, where we are encouraged to hold fast to the hope that we have in Christ, and we are also encouraged to look outwardly. We understand that coming to church is not about us. It is about worshiping God and serving and encouraging other people. So I would say that the local church, the local body of believers, is where these three calls converge in your life. The upward, inward, and outward. Have I said it enough this morning? I want you to really get that. The upward, inward, and outward call on your life. Every single one of them. If that is the case, and I truly believe it is, let me say a very blunt statement to the whole church and specifically to our graduates this morning. Your spiritual well-being in five to eight years will largely come as a direct result of the local church of which you are a member. Can I say that again in our good ear? Your spiritual well-being in five to eight years will largely come as a direct result of the local church of which you are a member. You might hear that statement and you might think that I am painting with a very broad brush and you would probably say there are exceptions to that rule and that is absolutely the case. There are usually exceptions to almost every rule. But I want us to be careful because usually when we say there's exceptions to the rule, what we're really saying is we like to judge ourselves by the exception and we like to judge everyone else by the rule. Your spiritual well-being in five to eight years will, be largely, will largely come as a direct result of the local church of which you are a member. Life rate research data shows that about 70% of young adults who indicated that they attended church regularly for at least one year in high school drop out of church. 70%. We had 19 students on stage. You do the math. Essentially what that says is that give it about five years or so, more than half of them will not be in a Bible-believing church. Does that scare you? (laughs) It doesn't necessarily scare me, but it does kind of challenge me, especially as the pastor. The congregation will rarely rise above the spiritual temperature of the pastor. And that, that puts an, a special burden on my heart, that that not be the case of these 19, that we have 100%, not just in church, but in the faith, living out the gospel daily. And so that's the stat, that 70% of young adults who indicated that they attended church regularly, and they defined what regularly meant, that they left the church after high school. An interesting additional study was done, 80% of those who dropped out of church said that they did not plan to do so during high school. That their intention all throughout their life was to be in church and to be an integral part of a body of believers. 80% of them who dropped out said, this was never the plan, I was always going to be in church, and now I'm not. It is not by accident It is by increments that something like this happens. I don't want to put fear in our hearts because I know that the Lord has a plan and there are those who will go off for a time and they come back to the faith. I understand that completely. I have friends who have done so. But we are not promised tomorrow. And so I want to challenge us this morning. The title of the sermon, I rarely give you the title of the sermon, is Don't Graduate from Church. That sounds so silly, but you see, you are at a point in your life, and I'm not just talking to graduates here this morning, you could be at a point in your life where you feel as though you don't need this anymore, and you'll just graduate on out. High school students who graduate this week they don't go back to their high school next week and just say, I just love it so much. If you do, you're crazy. I did not, that's for sure. 
never want to go back to those awkward years as if I'm not awkward enough now. We, we have this sense of I've graduated from this, I've graduated from that, I've got this new lease on life, I have more liberty now, and the most natural thing for many in our midst will be to never darken the doors of a church again except for Christmas and maybe Mother's Day if mom really begs me. And that's the challenge this morning is to not graduate from church. And so with that, and knowing that we had an extended preliminary time this morning, I just have three thoughts. And there are subpoints to those three thoughts, so don't think you're getting out too early. On you are in danger of graduating from church when you. Here's the first one. You're in danger of graduating from church when you only view church through what you get out of it. You have a very self-centered view of what can the church do for me. And when it seems as though the church is not fulfilling that role in your life, you think, who needs it? The danger in that, and I'll explain this a little bit later, is you may come to the point in your life where it's not just church that you write off, but it is God himself. And so I would say this morning that you are in danger of graduating from church when you only view church through what you get out of it. Churches all across America and probably even the world, they are filled with people this morning who they attend, but they never get involved. They never volunteer. They never help out. The extent of their attendance is sitting in a pew. A pew. And that is not church. It's not about attendance. When you view church as only things that you can get out of it, it usually comes when students, when you graduate from high school and you go to a different college and you don't get grounded in another church and you just kind of hop from one church to another and you only attend events that specifically appeal to you. You always have the option of, oh, I'll go to that or I won't go to this. You run the danger of graduating from church when you only view church as something that you can get something out of it. You only, when you only um, see church as something that you get something out of it, you open yourself up to being offended. By the way, let me just kind of park here for a little bit. You open yourself up to being easily offended. I'm reminded of wise words from someone who I incredibly respect. He once told me, just before I was going into the ministry, he said, Corey, you will get offended thousands of times in your ministry. Your success in the ministry will be based upon how you react to those offenses. And he was right. I got offended a thousand times the first week in ministry. No, I'm just kidding. Only a hundred times. Um, we seem to think that a church is filled with people who ought not say things, and they ought not say those things, but at the end of the day, they're filled with people who will still say things, and they'll still hurt your feelings, and they'll still say things that, come on. But it's how you respond to those offenses in your life that that will proclaim whether or not you're living a life of bitterness or you're living a life of joy. And my hope is that every single person who's in attendance in every church this morning is that they are here out of joy and not out of obligation and not out of bitterness. You see, sometimes church is described as a hospital, and I think that's a very valid parable. I think that's great. That we understand that this is a place where sick people, they are introduced to the great physician spiritually. I think that that is definitely the case. But with that analogy comes the danger of thinking that there are doctors in the church and there are patients in the church. That's not the case. It's not one ministering to another. It ought to be all Christians ministering to each other. So if you could think of a church and, and another analogy, I, w I would submit to you that you start thinking of it as nurses 
during a plague. All infected with the same disease, yet all ministering to each other. It's not the doctor and, and the patient and some standoffish thing and, oh, he didn't, he didn't meet my needs. He didn't heal me. He didn't help. That person has never helped me. It, it ought to be. Each Christian, a nurse, walking amongst the infected beds and the infected people. And I can guarantee you, when you come at it in that view, you'll understand that yes, you're going to get offended. And yes, you will have those hurts and you'll contract those plagues. But you're just a nurse. And the Lord's just helping you work and help in the hearts of these people. I think one of the points that shows us that we oftentimes come to church and we only sit here because we think of some, we can get something out of it is because I think more people come to church with a pitchfork instead of a fork. You might have heard this analogy before. A sermon is preached, a passage of scripture is read, and you think, man, that dude behind me really needed to hear that. Scoop it out, throw it back. When in all actuality, you probably just need to take a big old bite of it yourself. We come to church for what we can get out of it or what we think other people should get out of it. And so we come seated with our pitchfork, hoping to dish it out to everybody around us. Yeah, hey, hey, did you hear what he said? Wake up. Did you hear what the pastor just said? Hey, I'm talking to you. Did you hear? You really need to hear that. You'd really get a blessing from what Corey just said. Believe me. When at the end of the day, it would be much more helpful for us to pick up a fork and to ingest the truth of the gospel instead of just dishing it out amongst those in our pews. So you're in danger of graduating from church when you only view church through what you get out of it, number one. Secondly, you're in danger of graduating from church when you misprioritize your life. When you misprioritize your life. And I wrote down off to the side here in my notes that misprioritizing your life, it could be something as seemingly innocuous as staying up or staying out late on Saturday evenings and allowing yourself easy excuses on Sunday morning. I mean, that could be the very, very small thing there. It could go a little bit deeper and it could be the idea of misprioritizing your life by taking a job that you know will require you to miss church on a regular basis, knowing it and still doing it for extended periods of time. Misprioritizing your life and falling in danger of graduating from church, it may translate as to you dating a person who is not a believer, who finds no worth in the gospel, who finds no worth in getting up at 8.30 or 8.45 in the morning and going to church. They find no value in it. And it's at that point that I would just strongly urge you that you might be in danger of graduating from church because you have misprioritized your life. I think it's important for me to point out that almost no one purposely messes up their life's priorities. Almost no one does that. No one thinks, you know, family's going to come after the job and church is going to come after family and, and soccer is going to take preeminence over church this week. No, nobody signs up thinking that that will be the case. You might hear my comment about mishandling your Saturday evenings and, and you might think that that is, that is so petty, that is so elementary, that is so dumb for that to even be mentioned on a Sunday morning, but if you write, if you take notes, you might want to pin this. You cannot expect your life to have pri proper priorities if your hours do not have proper priorities. I have found, and I've been very real with you in past weeks when I've preached on things like this, I have found that the Saturday afternoons where I am thinking about and getting excited about church that I get more out of being amongst you. When I have prepared and planned not just a sermon, not just 
but just prepared my heart to be among others who need me and I need them in the faith. I have gotten more out of church those Sundays. We cannot expect our life to be prioritized correctly if our hours and our days are not prioritized correctly. If you're not prioritizing your life, I'm having a real rough time with that word right now. If you're not prioritizing your life, you know what you're doing? You are misprioritizing your life. Because anything and everything takes the priority because you have not set up a system in your life. So I think it's important for us to understand that we are in danger of graduating from church when we misprioritize our life. Third, you're in danger of graduating from church when you keep it shallow. You know, most people choose a church based upon style of music or events or ministries. They choose a church to be a member of that local group because of style more than upon doctrine. And that's dangerous. I hope you know how dangerous that is. That you would rather trade foundational truths of what a group of believers believes about the Bible over, oh, I love this song. That's dangerous. And so we are never more in danger of graduating from church when we just keep things shallow in our church experience. You keep church shallow when you don't hold yourself accountable to a small group or to a Sunday school. And you just kind of come to a worship service and we are so glad that you did. But you just come and then you leave before and you don't get to know anybody. That's not church. You're keeping it shallow. At that point, you're coming to an event, you're singing songs, and you're hearing a guy preach for 30 minutes or so, and that's it. You are never more in danger of graduating from church than when you keep it shallow by not holding yourself accountable to other people, to other Christians in your life, or when you isolate yourself from other generations. Brother David does an excellent job of making sure that our teens are oftentimes with our adults, our our children. We have uh, those who are first grade and up with us today. That's, That's not because we couldn't find enough people to work junior church. That's because we find great value at New Hope Church of your seven year old seeing an 80 year old worship. There's great value in that. You're never more susceptible susceptible to graduating from church when you just isolate yourself from different generations. Every single one of us, we need somebody to chase after someone who's older. We need somebody who is amongst us who's going to hold us accountable. And we need somebody younger than us who we can minister to. Don't keep it shallow, church. You stand in danger of thinking, waking up one Sunday and just thinking, you know, it's all right if I skip. It's not, God won't mind. But when you think of it in the lens of helping others and bringing in others and bringing up a younger generation and ministering to people who are your age and gleaning wisdom from those who are older, you see church in a whole new light. The church needs a younger generation to keep it passionate. It needs a middle generation for there to be power and there needs to be an older generation to be reminded of its purpose. And so I would strongly encourage you Even if you are involved in a small group that is around your age group, make sure that it's not just your clique, you're for and no more. Make sure that you're reaching out to people of other generations and you are ministering to and getting ministered from them. You're never more in danger of graduating from church when you keep it shallow. You see, Corey, you know, you have to say these things because you're the pastor, and if everybody just graduated from church, then you'd be out of job. That's true. But my primary goal in just this short time this morning is to not talk about church attendance per se. I I hope you don't think I'm that shallow. 
God knows my heart. The staff knows, knows the truth. I don't have a list of absentees. You weren't sitting in your pew this morning. Where were you? I care about your church attendance, but I don't, that's not where I, I glean your spiritual thermometer of your life, over whether you've been or not been to church. That's not what I'm talking about. My concern is God's call on your life. The upward call to come closer to God. The inward call to hold tighter to the faith. And the outward call that he can do great things through you so we ought to consider each other. If we are consistently placing ourselves in this position to stir up other believers, if we are giving up that opportunity where we just come to church and we don't minister to somebody else, we are one step closer to not holding fast to our faith. Which means, and follow my reasoning, that we are even one step closer to not drawing near to God. It's not just about church attendance. It's about being the church. And part of being the church is being here. <laughs> See, Corey, it's not about church attendance. It's, where else are you going to exhort believers this week? You going to stand outside of Dollar General? Are you a Christian? I exhort you. No. It's in the church. It's in a local group of believers. And so my caution is to not so much fill a pew, but to fill your role in the kingdom of God. He has placed an upward call, an inward call, and an outward call on your life. Don't graduate from God. Don't ever come to the point in your life where you look back and you think, I've accomplished a lot. And God is the furthest thing from your mind. I can promise you, the person who realizes the upward, inward, and outward call of God upon their life will never come to that point. They will consistently be drawing near, holding fast, and ministering to others. Don't graduate from church. Graduates, parents, grandparents, everyone. I need you. I get great encouragement from our time together. Forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. Exhort each other even more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray.